Hello everyone and welcome to this presentation. Today I'll be doing the presentation with the help of my colleagues Sukanya and Arnor. First, let's start with the agenda. In the beginning, I'm going to introduce the new SM32L4 S5 Discovery Kit IoT node. Then I will present the STSafe A110. Next, I'll go through the device provisioning options with AWS IoT. After that, I will go through the details of Xcube AWS 2.0.0. Before the hands-on session, I will go through the required tools and materials and go through the details of the scripts that we have prepared specifically for this seminar. We have planned three live hands-on. The first one is device registration and the use of the AWS Shadow Demo to connect to AWS IoT Core. The second one is we are going to de demonstrate the multi-account registration option and then we'll finish with the over-the-air update. And at the end, we'll finish with the conclusion. The new SM32L4 S5 Discovery Kit IoT node feature the new SM32L4 S5, which is based on the ARM Cortex M4 with floating point unit running at 120 MHz, 2 MB of flash, 640 KB of SRAM. The board also includes the STSafe A110 secure element, a Wi-Fi module for uh, wireless uh, connectivity with the cloud providers, a low power RF communication with Bluetooth 4.1 and dynamic NFC tag, a multiple sensor sensors including accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, humidity, temperature, uh, MEMS microphones and proximity sensor. Also, the board includes an Arduino and the P-Mode connectors to add extra feature to the board. The STSafe A110 is a highly secure solution that provides authentication and data management services. It can be integrated in uh, IoT uh, devices, smart home applications, smart city and industrial applications, consumer electronic devices. Its key features is authentications, of peripherals, uh, secure channel establishment with remote host including transport layer security for TLS handshake, signature verification services, uh, users monitoring with uh, secure uh, counters, uh, pairing and secure channel with host application processor, wrapping and unwrapping of local remote host envelopes, uh, on-ship key pair generation. Before your IoT device could connect and communicate with AWS IoT, you need to register with uh, AWS. AWS offers multiple options to register your device. So you can use the one-click X509 certificates that will require to create a certificate online and download it to your device. Also, you can use the just-in-time registration. So when your device uh, first connects to the, the first time to connect to the AWS IoT, the server will detect and know certificates and generated by registered CA and will auto-register the device certificate. You can use the just-in-time provisioning, the device provisioning at the first connection. And uh, to provision the device, you must enable automatic registration and associate a provisioning template with the CA certificate used to sign the device certificate. The new one is the multi-account registration. So the multi-account registration introduces an optional simplified registration step where customers can register their device certificate without requiring a certificate authority to be registered with AWS IoT. And customers also can move uh, devices easily between their AWS accounts. So this enables the multi-account registration. When you look at the different device registration options offered by uh, Amazon AWS IoT, all of them require the following. So you need a secure facility to install the certificate and the private key, a trusted user an application to install the certificate and the key. The certificate key must be unique and the key must be unique. The required registered uh, CA with uh, AWS. A certificate and key could be uh, compromised in some uh, conditions and thing can only be registered to one account except in the case of the multi-account registrations. So what is the solution? The STSafe A110 
comes with certificate and keys are pre-installed for ST, in ST's secure uh, facility and factory. ST is the trusted user that installs the certificates and the keys. The certificates and keys are guaranteed to be unique per device. You don't need, you don't need to register a CA with uh, AWS. That's thanks to the multi-account uh, registration feature that is supported with STSafe A100. The certificate and key cannot be compromised. That's thanks to the security features of uh, STSafe. Also, you have the multi-account registration. Also, on top of that, STSafe offers brand protection and uh, more uh, uh, options. The Xcube AWS is an SM32 Cube expansion pack for AWS IoT Core. It provides a qualified port for Amazon FreeRTOS to the SM32 L4S5 Discovery Kit IoT Node board. It offloads the security critical operations to the onboard SCSafe A110 during the secure boot and the secure firmware update, the TLS device authentication with AWS IoT Core Server, the verification of the over the air. OTA update firmware image and integrity and authenticity. And also it leverages the secure element provided provisioned certificates with AWS IoT Core multi-account registration feature. The Xcube AWS directory structure is as following. Here we have the drivers directory where we have the SM32 L4 drivers, the Synthesis driver and the BSP drivers of the components available on the board. And the middleware, we have ST's middleware drivers like USB library. And the third party, we have AWS FreeRTOS that includes the RTOS itself, the MQTT library, PKCS level library, and many more. The embed crypto and the embed TLS is the cryptographic library used by SPSFU and the main application. Under the project directory, we have the dedicated projects for the SM32 L4S5 Discovery Kit IoT node. First, we have the bootloader and SCSafe that includes the key management service blob library, SBSFU, which is the secure boot secure firmware update, and it is the root of trust for the Xcube AWS. The secure engine directory that contains the secure engine source, which is protected environment where all the critical data and operations can, can be managed in a secure way. SCSafe provisioning used to customize SCSafe A110. Under the cloud directory, we have the AWS demos, which is the, the project that runs Amazon FreeRTOS native demos. And at the end, we have the AWS test, where you can run AWS test project. To understand how Xcube AWS operates, we first need to explain the memory partitioning. The flash in the SM32 L4-5S is split as following. First, we have the SBSFU area where the SBSFU authenticates the application before running it and also authenticates and install new firmware and always runs first after reset. Also, we have the download image area, which is reserved for the OTA images received by the mail application. On top of it, we have the download image header, which is used by SBSFU to authenticate the new image before installing it. The active image hosts the main application, which includes Amazon FreeRTOS, the MQTT libraries, the OTA agent, and also communicate with AWS IoT Core. Also, the active image has its own active image header that is used by SBSFU to authenticate the main application before running it. Also, we have the swap area, which is used by SBSFU during firmware update. The SE Corbin is a library that is part of SPSFU and is shared with the main application. It always runs under the firewall. Also includes the Crypto library, the key management service, and communicate with SCSafe uh, with a secure manner. Also, the keys which are used to communi securely communicate with SCSafe are part of the SE Corbin and they are protected with the proprietary code protection uh, option of SCM32. Xcube AWS uses multiple keys and certificate. So the first one is the device certificate, which is part of SCSafe A100, is used to connect with AWS, and it's unique per device. Also, the device private key 
used to connect with AWS and it's unique per device. So the device certificate and the device private key, they are installed in ST's secure uh, manufacturing facility and they are unique per device. And all ST Safe A110 are provided with a unique certificate and unique private key. The host MAC key and the host cipher key that are present in ST Safe A100 and also in SBSFU. And they are used by the SE Corbin to securely communicate with the uh, ST Safe and encrypt the uh, data exchange between ST Safe and the SBSFU and the main application. The root CA present in ST Safe, it can be the same for all devices, and also uh, the OEMs can provide their own uh, root CA. We'll, you, we'll see the use of the root CA during, later during this presentation. Also, we have the OEM certificate, which is driver from the root uh, CA. Then on the image header, we have the OEM intermediate certificate, which is driven from the OEM certificate and can be unique per division within the same OEM. And then we have the firmware signing and SFU signing uh, certificates, which is uh, driven from the intermediate uh, certificate, which is unique per product. So these certificates they are used by SPSFU. We'll see how SPSFU use these certificates. And then in the main application, we have the OTA certificates, which is uh, used by the main application to authenticate any newly received OTA images. SCSA A110 is delivered with just a device certificate and a device private key, which are unique and they are used to connect with Amazon AWS IoT Core. So the SCSA provisioning project is used to load the, mo the host MAC key, load the host cipher key. So the host MAC key and the host cipher key are used to securely communicate between the SCSA and STM32 and encrypt the communication. Also load the root uh, certificate, load the OEM certificate, and then log SCSafe A110. So only a device with a uh, host MAC key and the host cipher key can communicate with SCSafe. So please note the default SCSafe provisioning project use the same host MAC keys and the host cipher keys, uh, the, root OE, uh, the root and OEM certificates for all the devices. Customers must personalize it for their final product. SE Corbin is built as a library for the following reasons. First, it runs under STM32's firewall. Also, it is shared between SPSFU and the main application. And also hosts uh, the STSafe pairing keys, which are shared with the STSafe provisioning project. SPSFU is used to guarantee a unique entry point after reset and to ensure immutable boot code. So it forms the root of trust for the application. Also, it enforces hardware security mechanism in STM32, like readout protection level 2, write protection, PC wrap, MPU configuration, firewall configuration, and enable the window watchdog. And also enforces security check and performs firmware image verification before execution. Also updates the user application in a secure way to prevent unauthorized update. Please note that delivered SBSFU does not enforce any security so that the user can still plug in and debug and uh, the application. So security must be enabled in production context. You can refer to the XUP AWS user manual for more details. After reset, SBSFU verifies the following. First, it verifies the device protection features like the readout protection level 2, MPU configuration, the firewall configuration, and any other security feature that is available on the microcontroller. Then it verifies the firmware signature and firmware signing certificate using the OEM intermediate certificate that are available in the active image header. And then it will you verifies the OEM intermediate certificate using the OEM cert that is available on uh, ST Safe, and then use the OEM certificate uh, and verifies the OEM certificate using the root CA. And when everything checks, then you will use the firmware signing and firmware signing certificate to verify the active image header and the active image itself. And if, if everything is checked OK, and then the SBSFU will jump to the active image and run the main application. The active image receives a new firmware update using OTA from uh, AWS, Amazon AWS IoT Core. So at this stage, the application image and header 
as seen as single encrypted blood from the main application. So the main active application verifies the received blob using the ODA cert and generate a reset to start SPSFU. So SPSFU received the received image using the certificate chain. And then SPSFU swaps the active image and the new image, including the header. So we'll do the uh, swap while decrypting the new image during the process, then generate a reset. And then after that, the normal boot process takes place as we explained earlier. SBSFU includes a rollback mechanism in the case of the old image phase to start or if the update was interrupted in the middle. In a way that guarantees that your application will always run even if uh, the image receives a corrupted image or the update was interrupted, for example, during a power loss or a, a sudden reset. As we have seen, there are multiple certificates and keys, libraries, and projects used in Xube AWS, and they must work together seamlessly. To do that, we need to follow a strict order of project compilation. Building Xcube AWS should follow this order. First, build the two images SE Corbin. This will include the SDSafe parent keys and generate a library called SE underscore core dot pen. Then we, should, we build the two images SPSFU. This will include the SE Corbin and generate the final SPSFU image. After that, we need to add the OTA certificate in the main application, build the main application, then generate the main application header, and then combine the main application header and encrypt it, and generate the .sfb file. So generating the image header and uh, combining the header and the main application is a script based. After that, we need to combine the SBSFU, the main application image, and the main application, application header, and uh, generate a single .bin file. Also, this operation is script-based, and it's handled automatically by the IDE. Now we have finished with the Xcube AWS package presentation. Before we go to the hands-on session, we need to go through the tools and the scripts that we have created specifically for this seminar. So the scripts can be found at the following link. Also, we need to download the Xcube AWS 2.0.0 from sd.com forward slash Xcube AWS. Also, we need the SM32 Cube IDE can be downloaded from sd.com forward slash SM32 Cube IDE. Also, we need the SM32 Cube Programmer can be downloaded from sd.com forward slash SM32 Cube Programmer. Also, we need uh, Python that can be uh, downloaded from python.org. Uh, here we use the latest because we tested our scripts with the latest uh, Python. And also, we need to install uh, uh, PySerial uh, using the command uh, pip install PySerial. Uh, also, we need the AWS uh, command line uh, interface uh, that can be found at the following link. And also, we need to download the OpenSSL that can be downloaded from the following link. Also, we need to ensure that OpenSSL is added to the path uh, used, uh, in the control pan uh, panel. So we go to the control panel, system, advanced system settings, environment variables, and we add the path for the OpenSSL. Now I'm going to show you how to get the Xcube AWS and also the scripts that we have developed specifically for this uh, seminar. First, open a web browser, go to www.st.com forward slash xcube AWS. And then click get software. And here you will be able to get the software. I already have downloaded this uh, previously, so I'm not uh, going to do it. After you download the uh, the Xcube AWS 2.0, you need to uh, extract it to uh, C drive. To get uh, the scripts, so go to st.com forward slash devcon dash mdg and hit enter, and this will download the zip file. So after the zip file is downloaded, so double click on it to open it, and then open uh, the st uh, 
the Xcube AWS uh, uh, project and copy paste the uh, in the Xcube AWS uh, 2.0.0. I already have done here, so they are, the file is already present here. So I will go ahead and open the, the directory and go through the details. So first here you will find the, the document. So here you will find the, this presentation. Uh, shortcuts here, so we have a shortcuts to the files that we are going to be using during the hands-on and uh, we are changing them. So these hand, uh, shortcuts, uh, they are uh, relative uh, paths, so it's uh, very important to have the AWS uh, Xcube AWS 2 version 2.0.0 extracted to, to uh, C drive. And then here you will see there are multiple uh, uh, scripts, so there are a batch uh, scripts and also uh, Python based uh, scripts. So there are three different types of uh, batch file scripts. So there are one that starts with SM32 cube prog. So these scripts use the SM32 cube programmer to uh, uh, update uh, the firmware and reset the board using uh, SM32 uh, uh, cube programmer and the uh, stlink. Also, there are other scripts that start with the AWS CLI. So these uh, scripts contain uh, AWS CLI's commands. So I will go ahead and open uh, one here in the editor. So these are, there are so uh, AWS uh, uh, specific commands to create, uh, to create a few things in uh, AWS. Also here we have a, uh, the third type of uh, batch files, so they start with the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So these are the scripts that uh, are going to be uh, really used during the, the hands-on. So these scripts, they make use of the other available uh, scripts. So I will open the first one. <clears throat> so here, uh, these scripts relies on uh, AWS uh, CLI profiles. So we will be using uh, during the hands-on uh, two uh, different profiles. The first one is called prod for production and the second one is called dev for the development. So here we are going to create two uh, different uh, AWS profiles and, uh, and uh, we are going to, uh, to be using them. So during the hands-on it's very important that you, cre uh, you create a prod account and a dev account. If you create uh, your accounts with different names, then you will need to go to this uh, uh, script files and um, uh, change uh, your profile names here. And you will see here the, the batch file will make use of uh, other uh, uh, batch files. Also, the, the batch file will create other text files that can be used uh, either for your own uh, records, so, so you, uh, you, will you will have traceability of what really happened the ARN uh, addresses and everything. And also these files are going to be used with the other uh, scripts to uh, build the commands for uh, AWS to create the certificates, to create uh, the OTA job, the sending profile, and the S3 bucket. Uh, the other file that is important is called keys.txt. So if you go over there, so we will fill in uh, our keys and uh, secret keys and endpoints uh, during the profiles creation in uh, AWS. Now let's start with the hands-on. So the first hands-on is device uh, registration. So the goal of the hands-on is to create uh, two uh, uh, different accounts in AWS, dev account and the product account, build Xcube uh, AWS, and use scripts to extract the thing name and the thing certificate from the SM32 and uh, SDSafe A110. And also create the thing in two AWS account, dev account or product account, with the same thing name and the same certificate using the multi account registration. And then at the end, we'll show a demo on how to verify the connection to product account. So now I will leave, uh, I will let my colleague uh, Arnur go through the live demo for the first uh, hands up. We'll need to make sure that the Xcube AWS package is extracted to our C drive. So wherever you have it downloaded from the ST website, just right click on it, select 7-zip, and then extract files. 
in order to place it on our C drive, we'll click Browse, this PC, and then Local Disk C, and OK. So everything looks good here. And we'll go ahead and start the extraction. Now when we open up our file explorer and navigate to our C drive, we'll see that there's a new file or a new folder called STM32 cube expansion. Uh, and so we can open that up to the side. And what we'll need to do is place our DevCon folder in that main directory. Now we can create our AWS IAM production and development user accounts. To do so, you'll have to log in to your AWS console. Um, I've already done so on Chrome. And select IAM by typing IAM in the search bar on the landing page. In the left, you can select Users, and then at the top, Add User. We already have an account called Dev, so for example purposes, we'll call this account that we're creating Dev1, um, and we'll check programmatic access as well as AWS management console access. Um, and then we'll auto-generate a password, and since this is an example, we won't require a password reset. Under permissions, we'll attach admin access. And no tags are required for this demo, so we'll just press next. Everything looks good here, so we'll create the user. On this page, there's a lot of important security credential information. So first and foremost, we'll have to download the .csv file. And additionally, we'll want to copy and paste um, some of these credentials into our keys oops, into our keys.txt file within the devcon folder. So we'll open that up and push it to the side. Um, so you have your two accounts that we'll be creating here. We'll copy the access key ID and paste, as well as the secret access key and you'll want to keep your password in a safe location also. It's helpful to log into your second AWS account in a different browser. So in Edge, I'm logged into our second account and I'll follow the same steps to create our production IAM user. Under IAM users, add user, prod, um, since we already have a prod account, I'll call this one prod1. Check both boxes and uncheck required password reset. Grant administrator access. No tags. Create user. Again, we'll want to copy all the security information into our keys.txt file. So. and make sure to download the .csv file as well. To log into your newly created IAM user accounts, you'll have to log out of the account you're currently logged into. And select log back in. We'll do this for both our dev and prod account. So I'll open Chrome as well. And we'll log into dev and prod. The passwords will be contained in those .csv files that we downloaded. But since I've created dev1 and prod1, for example, I'll copy my passwords from the safe location that I've stored them in.
One thing to make certain of is that your two accounts are logged into the same region. For the purpose of this demo, we've used Ohio, US East 2. Now there's one more field that we'll need to fill in in our keys.txt file, and that's the endpoint. So you can go ahead and select I or search IOT core in both accounts. And under settings, you'll see the endpoint for both of your different accounts. So we'll copy those. And paste them in our keys.txt file as well. Now that our keys.txt file is fully populated, we'll make sure to save it. Next, we can remove read-only attributes on some of the files in our Xcube AWS package. To do so, we'll open up our DevCon folder again, and underneath shortcuts, we'll see a folder called demos. We'll open that, and then the include folder, we'll right-click, scroll down to properties, and then see how it says read only here. We're going to uncheck that. Apply. Apply changes to folder and its subfolders. And select OK. Next, we'll need to enable the shadow demo. To do so, we'll go back to our STM cube expansion folder. And under DevCon, go to shortcuts, AWS demos config.h. And it will open up a folder, I mean, it will open up a file in your default text editor. For me, that's Visual Studios. In line 45, it should say config OTA update demo enabled. We're going to replace that with line 33. So config shadow demo enabled. So we'll control C and then select and control V. File, save those changes. Now we can configure our AWS credentials. To do so, we'll minimize this window. And back in our shortcuts directory, we'll select AWS credentials.h. And for MQTT endpoint broker, that's going to be the endpoint that we copied and pasted in our keys.txt file for dev. Our thing name is actually printed on a sticker on the back of our physical device. Um, it should look similar to mine. Our Wi-Fi SSID is the SSID for your network. And your Wi-Fi password is the password for your network. Once we fill in all those fields, we'll go ahead and press Save. Just to clarify, we've listed the dev account endpoint here because for the first part of this demo, we'll be connecting to the dev account with our device. Later on, we'll replace it with our prod endpoint, which will allow us to connect to our prod account. Just a note before we continue, ensure that the network you're connecting your device to is a 2.4G network, as this device is not capable of connecting to a 5G network. Also, the most common security for home and business networks is WPA2, so unless you're sure that your security protocol is different, don't worry about changing this field here. Now we can open Cube IDE. So on our desktop, select Cube IDE and launch. So we'll want to import our project into our Project Explorer. So file, import, under general, we'll select existing projects into workspace. And next, um, we'll browse for the folder. So on our C drive, we'll select STM cube expansion project. 
and then projects, BL for S5i, applications, and then select folder. We will not be needing the test project today, so we can unselect it and hit finish. Now, as you can see, we should have four projects imported into our workspace. These projects should be built in a specific order. The first project that should be built is SE Corbin. So we'll right click, scroll down to clean project, and then build project. Second project to build is SBSFU. Again, right click, clean project, right click, build project. Next is ST Safe Provisioning. Right click Clean Project and Build Project. And lastly is AWS Demos. Clean Project, Build Project. Next, we'll configure our profiles in our AWS CLI. To do so, we'll open Command Prompt and type in AWS configure two dashes and then profile and then the profile name. So for us, we'll do dev first. Okay, now the access key, if you remember, we pasted that into our keys.txt folder, our keys.txt file. The secret access key is here as well. Region is going to depend on your geographical location. For us, it's US East and then the output form is JSON and we'll do the same for our prod account And now both of our profiles are configured in AWS CLI. A command we can use to test our AWS CLI connection is AWS IoT describe endpoint and then the profile. So we can verify here that these endpoint addresses are the same, and we'll do this for prod as well. And verify again that the endpoint addresses are the same. Now what we can do is run our first script. So in preparation for doing that, we'll make sure our device is connected. And then we'll also open up our AWS console in um, IoT Core for both prod and dev. And we'll navigate back to our um, DevCon directory and double click zero create mar. So basically what this script is doing is flashing our firmware. Um, after it flashes our firmware, it extracts a certificate for the device and the thing name So here it's flashing the firmware.
And now it's extracting the certificate there, as well as the thing name. It will use that certificate and thing name to then connect to AWS and create a thing, a certificate, and a policy for the thing in both the prod and dev account. Now that the script is finished running, it's just outputting what is going through the serial communication port. Um, and we can take a look um, in our Devon prod account, refreshing. So if we go to manage and things, we can see that we have two new devices created. Also certificates, we have a new device certificate created in both accounts. Um, that matches here. And if we go to activity in the dev account, If we go to activity in the dev account, we can see now that a shadow is being published to our AWS console and dev, but we are not having that shadow published here on our prod account. Um, also, we can review the policies. Um, so if we go to certificates, again, that new certificate that was created. This is the policy that was created within our script. Um, and as you can see here, the demo is running in the background on our device. We can also take a look at the files that were outputted by our script. If we check back into the DevCon folder, um, you can see that there were two output files here. These basically give a verbose output for all the commands that were run for AWS CLI, as well as our policies for both accounts. Um, you can open these and take a look at them as well. There was also a certificate for our device um, that was generated, a temporary text file, which doesn't contain too much important information, and then thing name.txt, which will contain the thing name of our device. Thank you, Alnur. And now we'll move uh, to the second hands-on, which is the multi-account uh, registration. So for the goal of this uh, hands-on is to demo the multi-account registration, where we are going to create a signing uh, certificate with using uh, OpenSSL. So this is, will be needed in reality for the third uh, lab uh, for the OTA but we are we need to uh, generate it in this lab and include it in the in the project and then uh, we are going to enable the OTA uh, demo change the firmware uh, to connect to the product account instead of the dev account so the first one will be uh, creating the signing uh, certificate so the signing certificate is used by the OTA agent to do, to verify the new image <clears throat> So this step is only needed in uh, one time for a given program. You don't need to generate a certificate for every single device you have. So one, one certificate will be used across all the devices within the same project. After that, we'll need to open the generated certificate and copy it in the AWS underscore OTA underscore PAL dot C. Uh, enable the AWS OTA demo in the AWS demo config.h, set the endpoint address. So we change it from the dev account to the product account, uh, build AWS demo, and then flash uh, the demo. And after that, we are going to verify 
that the board is connected to the product account. Now I will let my colleague Sukanya to go through the hands-on. Now that we have the thing, certificate, and policy created in AWS, the next step to doing the ODA update is creating the code signing certificate. Now the script number one that you see over here does that. As a prerequisite, OpenSSL should be installed. Before you click on the batch file number one, open up uh, cert underscore config.txt in a text editor and change the email that is provided here to yours. Once this is done, let's double click on one underscore create certificate dot bad. Once this is done executing, let's make sure that everything was executed successfully. Now this batch file one underscore create certificate dot bad generates three output files one underscore cert dot, uh, cert output dot txt and ecdsa signer dot cert and ecdsa signer dot key which will be used later. Now to make sure that everything went well on the AWS side, open up the AWS account with the prod login and click on, a uh, on Certificate Manager. Over here, you will see that a certificate was just created. Now, we need to configure the firmware for the OTA update. Go to the working directory and click on Shortcuts. The four files that you see displayed over here are the ones that we will be changing throughout the process. Double click on each of these files to open them up in QBIDE as I have done already over here. Let's go to AWS underscore client credential dot H file. The MQTT broker endpoint that is displayed over here is that of the dev account. We need to change it to the MQTT broker endpoint associated with that of the prod account. To find the endpoint that is associated with the prod account, open up AWS management console of the prod, click on IoT core, and on the left hand side, click on settings. The endpoint will be displayed over here. Let's copy the endpoint and paste it over here. The next is go back to the working directory and we need to open acdsa signer.cert in a text editor as shown here. Now, go back to QBIDE, open AWS underscore ODA pal dot C and replace PC client certificate dot PEM, uh, PC client certificate PEM with the one that we just opened up right now. Make sure to do it in the manner that is displayed over here. Don't forget the new line character for the end of each line. Once this is done, let's open AWS underscore demo config dot H and change config shadow demo enabled to config OTA update demo enabled. Now, right click on the project, clean project, and build. Now that, it's, now that it's done building, let's go back to the working directory and double click on stm 32 cube programmer underscore update in order to flush uh, the program that we just built to the board.
Now, since we changed the MKTT broker endpoint from that of the dev account to the prod account, let's go into the prod account and make sure that the device is now connected in the prod account. So, if you open up AWS Management Console of the prod account, click on IoT Core, and on the left hand side under Manage and Things, click on the thing, and under Activity, you will be able to see activity that has just happened. Thus, the device is now connected to the prod account. Thank you, Sukanya. Now let's continue with uh, our last uh, hands-on, which is over the air update. So the goal of this is to perform an over the air uh, update. So to do that, we need to change the firmware version number, create a code signing profile, create an OTA role, create an S3 bucket and upload our new firmware to the S3 bucket, and then create an OTA job and push the OTA. So what is OTA? OTA stands for over the air update. It allows you to deploy firmware updates to one or more devices in your fleet. FreeRTOS over the air updates makes it possible for you to deploy new firmware images to a single device, a group of devices, or the entire fleet. Deploy firmware to devices as they are added to groups, reset, or reprovision it. Also, verify the authenticity and the integrity of the new firmware after it's deployed to devices. Monitor the progress of a deployment and debug failed uh, deployment. So the OTA activity flow is as following. First, in Cube IDE, we increase the firmware version, build the project, and create a .sfb file. And then we need to upload that .sfb file to an S3, S3 bucket in AWS. Then sign the image, and then create an OTA job. So once the OTA job is created, so the file, the new image is sent to, uh, to your device. So the OTA agent that is running on your application will download the image stream. And then the OTA agent will verify the image signature versus the signing certificate that is embedded in the firmware, store the firmware in SBSFU update slot in flash, and set the image slot to new. And then we'll initiate a reset. So after reset, SBSFU will take control and will install the new, verify the new image and install the new image and set the new image state to self-test. And then we'll call and uh, run the new image in self-test mode. So if the self-test test mode success, then the image will set its um, state to valid and report its states to AWS. In the case of the self-demo fails. So there are two cases here. The, the first one, for example, uh, the application uh, fails to the connect to AWS. So the application will set its state to invalid, issue a software reset. SPSFU will detect that uh, the image state is invalid and will revert the image to the uh, older one and then uh, run the old image. And then the old image will report its status to AWS. The second uh, uh, possibility that there was a, a hardware watchdog reset during the self-test. For example, the application fails to start. So SBSFU would detect that there was a watchdog reset, will set the image state to invalid, revert the image to the old one, and then run the old image, and the status will be re reported to AWS. Now let's continue with the steps. So first thing we need to open uh, the AWS application underscore version dot H and change the application version major from zero to one, then build the project. So to build the project, you need you can right click on the project name and then click build project. After that, we need to create a code signing profile in AWS. So this will can be done using the, uh, the batch file. Please note that this is needed only one time per project, so you don't need to do that for every single device. It's only one time for pro per project. The next one is to create an OTA role. So creating OTA role on AWS, we can do that using the batch file. That's the same thing, so this step is only needed one time for a given program. Next, you can check the OTA role and the attached required policies in AWS console. After that, we need to create an S3 bucket and upload the uh, newly created uh, firmware image, the .sfb. Uh, this also can be uh, done uh, using the, the, script, the available script. 
So we can verify in uh, AWS console that a new uh, uh, bucket has been created and also you can check uh, the content of that bucket and you will see that the .sfb file has been uploaded to that bucket. Once that's done, so we need to uh, create and push the OTA update. So this is also can be done using uh, the, the batch file. So once uh, the OTA uh, job has been created, we'll see some activity on the on the console output of your uh, board and you will see th uh, that the board starts receiving uh, the new firmware. Also, you can check the OTA update status on the AWS uh, console by checking the job and you can see here the status of the of the update. Now, I will let uh, my colleague Sugania go through the live uh, demo. Now that this is done, let's go back to Cube IDE and go to AWS underscore application version dot H and change the application version from zero to one. Remember that this step is very important. Now clean the project. And build. Now that we have the code signing certificate created, the next step is creating the code signing profile. Bad script number two that you see over here does that. It uses cert underscore config dot txt that was generated by the first batch file. Let's click on two underscore create, si uh, create signing profile. Once this is done, let's make sure that two underscore signer dot txt is generated and populated. Now to make sure that everything went well on the AWS side of things, Let's make let's uh, go to the C, uh, the command prompt and first make sure that we're logged into the prod account over here by typing AWS configure. Once we're sure that the access key ID that is displayed is associated to, uh, is the one that is associated with the prod account, let's move forward and type a, uh, and type AWS signer list signing profiles. You can now see here that the that this profile was created. Script number three creates an OTA role and attaches all the required policies, which is the next step to doing the OTA update. It requires role policy.json that is already provided here in the working directory. Let's double click on three underscore OTA uh, create OTA role. Once this is done executing, it'll generate two output files. One of them, three underscore role, uh, three underscore role dot txt, which is populated here. And the other is stm32 l4s5 underscore ota policy dot json. Now to verify on the AWSI, let's go to the prod account and click on IAM. On the left hand side under access management, let's click on roles. Over here, we can see that this is a role that we have just created with the attached policies. The next step to doing the OTA update is creating and versioning the S3 bucket. The bad script number four that you see here does that. It requires thing underscore name dot txt, which was created by script number zero, as well as the SFB file location that is mentioned inside bad script number four. Now, let's double click on bad script number four. Once this is done executing, it will produce four underscore bucket dot txt as an output. Let's double click to make sure that it's populated. To make sure that everything went well on the AWS side of things, Go on to the AWS Management Console of the Prod account. Click on S3. 
and notice that this is the bucket that we have just created with the uploaded .sfb file. The last and final step to doing the OTA update is creating a job and pushing the OTA. Path script number 5 that you see here does that. It uses thing name underscore txt that was generated by running bath script number 0. It uses the bucket that was generated by running bath script number 4, the role from bath script number 3, and the certificate and signing profiles from bath scripts number 1 and 2 respectively. Now, let's go ahead and double click on file underscore publish underscore OTA dot bath. Here we can see that the OTA update status stays as a job was created. Now you can see that there is a lot of activity that's going on on the terminal. The board is now receiving the new firmware. Let's go ahead and look. Before we look at the AWS console, we can see that a reset is, has been generated and SBSFU has started. SBSFU is now verifying the firmware image. Here we can see that the OTA demo version says 1.9.2. The version that we had flashed onto the board is 0. Thus, SVSFU has now installed the newer version of the firmware. Let's go ahead to the console, make sure it's the prod account, click on IoT Core, go to Manage and click on Jobs. Let's click on the job that we just created and you can see that the status says succeeded. In addition, running bat script number five generates this particular text file as an output. In addition to this text file, OTA fields and OTA update.json. We thus have a successful OTA. Thank you, Sukanya. Now we can conclude our presentation. So during this presentation, we introduced the Xcube AWS 2.0.0, which provides a qualified port of Amazon FreeRTOS. We bring a highly security thanks to SPSFU and SDSafe A110. And we demonstrated easy of use thanks to multi account registration, SDSafe A110, and the script based provisioning and OTA updates. Uh, for if you have uh, any questions, so please don't hesitate to contact us using the uh, online support, ST online support, and also you can post your questions to uh, Amazon uh, forum. Thank you, and I hope that you like this presentation. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. It depends from where you are watching this webinar. First and foremost, I want to thank ST Microelectronics for this opportunity to participate this year at the first ever virtual ST developer conference. I have been uh, to ST DevCon for the last three years. I love the community and I'm certainly looking forward to see you all next year in person. It's not a secret that IT is more than a buzzword nowadays. When I'm looking for the number of connection in my house um, at my three node mesh router, I'm often speechless. Um, and this is for the family of three. Um, it is norm for my daughter to ask Alexa to spell a difficult word, um, close blind or change TV program. While I still reach out for dictionary and more often use 
remote. So undoubtedly, uh, the number of things gonna be big. We don't know exact number, but we definitely know that um, IoT number is gonna be much larger than the uh, population of Earth. At AWS, we are blessed to collaborate with many incredible teams building myriad innovative solutions. I had the privilege to work with iRobot at early days when they were migrating all the infrastructure to AWS IoT. And at that time, we had only very secure and scalable AWS IoT um, core message broker and um, um, identity service. Um, we had like very limited capabilities um, for for the device management, uh, for entire analytic service. So pretty much everything has to be wired to this wide range of uh, AWS uh, building blocks. While ST was our strong partners even before uh, AWS took over uh, FreeRTOS project. Um, like for example, the the first um, the first dash buttons uh, they had a SM thirty two F two zero five if I am not mistaken uh, MCU. Um, this year, I see a lot of customers that are building solutions with STM thirty two MCUs. We see a lot of interest in in the STM thirty two H seven F seven L plus series. Um, and I cannot wait when the STM32WB and STM32WL will be included um, into Xcube AWS to give um, to give developers uh, this this broader access uh, to AWS IoT uh, services uh, from the Beely or Zigbee um, enabled products or from LoRa products um, because STM32WL is the first um, first combo MCU that has the LoRa radio uh, on the same chip. So what customers doing with AWS IoT? Um, the companies like Fender um, optimizing their manufacturing line. Um, Philips, for example, they designed and deployed uh, a system for remotely monitoring uh, patients uh, in a healthcare industry. And the um, companies like Visio, iDevices, iTron, um, building connected home uh, and cities, uh, Bayer uh, built a solution for growing healthier crops. Uh, with a greater efficiencies. And the companies like Volkswagen, <clears throat> um, they optimizing all their manufacturing clients to be IoT connected, to optimize all the processes, um, to basically gain this efficiency. But nobody just buys the IoT technology for the sake of technology. Everyone seeks business outcomes. And typically, um, customers looking uh, to optimize these two categories, right? So it's either operational efficiency, um, where we want to decrease operational expenses, or um, in a revenue growth where the data-driven IoT solution can provide a new services or even business models or to create a better relationship with your customers or optimize your product over the time. So what are the building blocks of AWS IoT? So we roughly can divide it into three categories. <clears throat> we have services and software for building edge devices. 
we have uh, a connectivity and control services. And finally, the services that allows companies to make sense of the data flowing from all of the devices. And all of those services are organically working together. Um, and even with the other AWS services like Redshift for data warehousing um, or DynamoDB, uh, TimeStream as a database option, um, or Lex, for example, to create intelligent chatbots. Let's briefly walk through all of the services that AWS IoT offers at the moment. We have software and the services to build and test connected devices. And we will talk about some of those like FreeRTOS and IoT device tester in more details later. Moving to the control services, uh, the lower left corner, we have AWS IoT Core. The components of AWS IoT Core include uh, an identity service providing authentication and authorization, a device gateway to securely connect devices to AWS cloud services, a message broker uh, that processes and routes data messages to the cloud and between devices, a rules engine that triggers action on your devices. We actually recently got our 20th native rule integration, uh, this time with AWS TimeStream database. Uh, it's a database that's specifically designed for time series data and optimized for IoT workloads. Um, device Shadow that enables application to interact with devices even when they are offline. For example, they are uh, in a deep sleep mode. And a registry that enable, enables automatic device registration and performs searches like with devices uh, like which devices were were, were made in, in 2016, for example. Um, AWS IoT Device Management helps you to manage your fleet of devices. You can easily perform bulk registration of devices, fleet indexing and searches, device logging and monitoring, jobs, like, for example, over-the-air updates, uh, secure tunneling, which is primarily focused on the on the Linux, uh, on the embedded Linux devices at the moment. Um, and finally, um, in this category, device uh, defender service that helps you to monitor uh, the device configuration and uh, all the deviation from from the norm. It also allows you to identify and mitigate the anomalies in the device traffic, like two devices connected with the same certificate or frequency of the messages increased. Um, and going to the top category, we have um, AWS IoT Sitewise. Um, it's a helpful tool to build dashboards and uh, to bridge an industrial sensors like those connected through Modbus or OPC UA uh, to the cloud. AWS IoT Analytics um, is a specialized data store for IoT data and allows you to build pipelines to enrich and combine data from different sources. AWS IoT Events can help uh, to drive decisions based on a very complex logic. Um, uh, the team recently, uh, the uh, AWS IoT Events team, recently open sourced uh, their diagram maker, uh, the tools to create, uh, modify um, graph-like data uh, and obviously visualize uh, the uh, graph-like data. And finally, uh, AWS IoT ThingGraph, uh, which is a bit of futuristic service that helps you visually wire your IoT solution and which is based on a, on a device behavior. As an example, for example, the camera, uh, the, the video camera uh, can trigger the output, can, can get the input from who came through the, through the uh, front gate or the door, and uh, it can trigger an actions, for example, to 
set up the uh, comfortable room temperature or house temperature um, and for example uh, to turn on lighting if this is this is the night uh, based on the uh, on the on the preference of this particular person I would like to keep as as much time as possible for for the awesome demo uh, we prepared for you so I cannot go into much details for each of those services but I would like to highlight some that will be important when you are designing and building connected devices. So how can you build devices uh, at the age that work with AWS IoT? Typically those devices based either on microcontrollers like STM32 Alpha Plus uh, or STM32 H7 or microprocessors like for example STM32 MP1. Our preferred way for building MCU based solution is FreeRTOS and um, using our connectivity security and management uh, libraries and Greengrass um, for microprocessor based, des based designs. Typically those running um, some sort of embedded Linux um, operating system. Why FreeRTOS? Um, FreeRTOS leads the MCU real-time operating system category. In a recent market study, uh, FreeRTOS was rated to be used in 28% of embedded projects in the next uh, 12 months, uh, with the next MCU OS coming at 9%. Um, AWS continues to invest in FreeRTOS since taking over the project while keeping it open source with um, even more permissive license, which is MIT open source license. Um, we also recently announced support for two new architecture, RISC-V and ARM V8M. Um, and we welcome um, the upstream uh, pull request for, uh, for new architecture if you happen to, uh, to port Freer toss to the to the to the new architecture. Freer toss includes the Freer toss kernel, the market leading real time operating system for microcontrollers, and um, we are very honored that Richard Barry, who invented Freer toss fifteen years ago, has joined AWS as a senior principal engineer working on Freer toss. It also has a number of local cloud connectivity libraries, um, also security libraries like uh, like TLS and PKCS11, um, and um, more AWS specific is a device defender uh, library that resides on a microcontroller um, and enrich the metrics that device defender service. Uh, sees at the cloud side. And finally, over there updates and code signing libraries that allows for, uh, for securely update your, um, your connected devices in a field. So let's take a deeper look into each and every of these libraries or categories of libraries. Um, before I will continue, um, we right now have a very comprehensive documentation for all of the libraries we released uh, at freeartos.org. Uh, and I urge you to, to take a look and give us the, the honest feedback. Um, but you can find their comprehensive examples, um, also the architecture and um, the API uh, description for each and every library. So 
The local connectivity from battery powered devices is very important in our reference architecture. And it allows to keep those devices in a deep sleep mode uh, for extended period of time. Um, it's also important that these devices, when connected to local gateway, the local gateway can optimize and aggregate the payload from those devices um, and then send this optimized payload uh, to the cloud. Um, and it's important if your communication channel is expensive, for example, satellite or some expensive cellular uh, connectivity, right? Um, it's also interesting um, the approach that the team took when architecting the Beely management library. Um, we implemented um, an abstraction layer um, for get and gap. Um, there was a debate if um, if IP-based communication would be more preferable and kind of seamless, but since um, since Beely supports uh, cloud connectivity only through intermediate proxies, um, such as iOS or Android devices or Greengrass Gateway, um, the cat and gap implementation is extremely elegant uh, and also simple. Um, we also provide the Wi-Fi credential provisioning over BLE um, in the designs where the Wi-Fi connectivity module and BLE module uh, coexist on, on, the, on, on the device. The cloud connectivity <coughs> um, allows uh, to reuse the same MQDT libraries to connect to AWS IoT core. We also now support HTTPS for cloud connectivity, um, um, primarily for over the air update, but um, you also, um, for example, can directly access um, any of AWS services through the RESOL API that is obviously based, based on, um, on HTTP standard. Um, and um, we have a, finally the, the uh, JSON parser that allows you to interact very efficiently with the device shadows. As, a, as I mentioned before, uh, shadows is a representation of the state of your device in the, in the cloud. For the security, we have implementation of secure sockets using TLS, uh, certificate-based mutual authentication, uh, PKCS 11 subset of, um, of, of the standard for key management. Um, and you will be working with, uh, and you will see the demo later today, um, with um, STM32 L+. Uh, board that has the STSafe A110 secure element um, pre-populated on it and pre-provisioned, and you will see how the uh, uh, how the secure element uh, support implemented and how the PKCS11 library is is used. And obviously, because it's an open source. Um, you you can verify your code, but on our side, um, some of the some of the portion of the code, and we and we're striving to deliver um, all code um, is actually undergoing formal verification. Uh, currently, for example, the TCP plus uh, FreeRTOS plus TCP libraries uh, undergoing through uh, through formal uh, formal verification. Over there updates is extremely important because um, in the for the connected devices, uh, if you don't have an ability to update the firmware on this device, it's becoming a you know doorstop in a um, in a year, right? So um, the our over there library um, implements two transport protocols, um, you can choose either to reuse the MQTT 
connection that you're already using as your controlling data connection, um, or you can opt for HTTPS if you have additional resources on your on your microcontroller um, and don't want to be metered uh, on the on the number and the size of messages. Um, also, in July release of FreeRTOS, we implemented um, uh, and over there library supports pause resume uh, OTA functionality. AWS IoT Device Defender, it's, uh, it's a library on, on the microcontroller as well as the service uh, at the cloud that allows you to audit um, monitor devices and also to identify anomalies in your in your traffic right um, and also react to those anomalies to recap free RTOS provides you with trusted robust kernel a royalty free open source license um, cloud agnostic libraries. You can use um, our implementation for MQTT or Beely um, with our cloud, and we would be happy, but uh, you can use it with your on-premise broker if you want. Um, possibility for commercial support, um, comprehensive documentation for the kernel and all of the libraries on freeartos.org, Libraries for transport security and key management based on open standards. And finally, over there, update mechanism using either MQTT or HTTPS. Now that, um, that we built our product, how can we be sure that our product would behave in the field the way it intended to do? Well, there are a lot of unknown factors. Uh, we have to, we have no control for controls for, like network outages, application code logic, um, environmental condition. We can perform a number of unit tests to verify that our libraries performs as they were designed. I mean, the free RTOS libraries uh, and connectivity libraries perform as they were designed. AWS provides device tester for FreeRTOS and for AWS Greengrass. Um, the product is locally installed on your computer. It connects to your MCU board through serial connection and to embedded Linux board um, through the SSH connection. And it performs, uh, it compiles uh, and performs a number of tests um, uh, in, in case of FreeRTOS and in case of the Greengrass, um, it brings the, the Greengrass binary um, and run a number of unit tests to test the functionality. For example, uh, how the hardware security integration works with the, with the uh, TPM or um, how the stream manager um, uh, works. Um, do I have a MQTT connectivity to the cloud um, up to the up to the standard, um, and so on, so on. You can also choose a pre-qualified platforms from AWS device catalog, such as, for example, STM32L Plus. Uh, or STM32 H7, uh, F7, uh, the L475. Um, one thing that I should really thank uh, my ST colleagues um, that they've been working very diligently to package the libraries uh, and, and, and kernel into Xcube AWS pack um, that allows you to consume all these libraries in a very natural way for the developers through the Cubemax and through um, STM Cube uh, ID 
So right now it's much, much simplified developer experience. And finally, while we just touch the very basic of AWS IoT services, I would like to show you uh, the AWS investment to deliver the most comprehensive edge solution. So in addition to all IoT services, um, we developing a product like Wavelength to deliver ultra low latency application to 5G connected devices or um, the Snow family of products like with um, Snowball, uh, Snowball Edge uh, and recently the very cute and small snow cone and to the, to the monsters like Snowmobile. Um, AWS Outposts to bring, uh, to bring basically AWS building block services to your data center or close to, to your customers. Um, and SageMaker Neo, for example, to optimize your ML models um, and do your inference from the edge devices. Thank you. And I'm passing baton to my ST colleagues who prepare a fantastic demo for you that include almost all of the concepts we just touched upon.